these are all shot at um, either the Everglades or kind of... Bonnie Chin designed this new 3D activity to connect evolution and genetics for her ninth grade honors biology class in Belmont, Massachusetts. For today, you just happen to be a species of wading bird that has a beak that looks like this. And this is what you can use to feed with. In this simulation, each group of students represents a population of 100 wading birds. procedures for the lab today. You're going to be working in groups of threes or fours. Just go ahead and work it with the people in your row. Okay, what you're going to do is there are three types of food. You've got types that stay on the bottom, and they're actually labeled. There's a C to represent those that stay on the bottom. And then you've got food pieces that kind of stand up in the middle of the water column. And then finally, we have some pieces that, that kind of float at the top of the, of the aquarium. All right, why don't you go on back to your groups? Yeah. Students construct their beaks from tongue depressors, screws, and rubber bands. Yeah, I'll hold this and then you tie the rubber band around. Okay. For each individual in their group, they place four pieces of each food type in their group's tank. Then they feed one at a time for three 15-second trials, following clearly defined rules. Stop. Follow the rule. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What? You got to make sure. See how your tongue is wet? you got to follow the rules. Differences in feeding styles become immediately apparent. You can feed on anything you can grab legally. So, yeah, I know. I All right. So I obviously went for the floaters first because they were easy and quicker. And then I started going for the middle ones. Oh, Chris. Oh, Chris. He's amazing. He's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Right now, you should be working on the two discussion questions that go with the feeding, and then you can move on to the section on mutations, okay? Students then discuss and compare the feeding success of the individuals within their groups. We all have similar ones. Mike had a little bit more. He had 12. Next, Ms. Chen introduces random mutations in the gene that codes for beak length. Winner is... Beaks of the new generation will be the same as, shorter than, or longer than the parents, according to the mutation they select. Hmm. I'll have to go with this one. Everybody has a different mutation, so you need to figure out what you need to do to your DNA. Deletion, what mutation do? Well, we talked about deletion. These students are already familiar with the basics of evolution, natural selection, mutation, and DNA transcription and translation. Yes. So one, two, Good. three, four, five, six, six, seven. I substitute the thirteen. So this activity calls on them to use that knowledge to follow the mutation from DNA to amino acid sequence to determining the phenotype. You have a duplication of the chromosome. Remember when we talked about yesterday? Mm -hmm. so. Now remember, the key is now going to tell you what type of beak your offspring, your offspring will have. have Using this. the key, each student determines the beak length of his or her offspring and builds it if necessary. Yay. Wait, wait, so how do I do this? Can you translate this for me? Uh, okay, what you do is you have A, U, G, right? So you go to A, and you go to U, and you find G. So you're Don't forget that you represent the offspring now, not the parent any longer. You're an offspring with a new beak. And now you're going to feed, but this time, instead of feeding alone, you're going to feed together as a group. The whole group picks up food, food at the same time? Right. So and some then the other group monitors? Yes. If we all have different lengths of beaks in our group, should we like try and work together and like coordinate how, like if a short beak picks up the A, or should we just like all no. try and do a free-for-all? No. This, this, this is a free-for-all. Just set. Go. It's mine. Ah! Competitive feeding adds a new dimension to the simulation. Five seconds. Three, two, one. That's it. That wasn't fair at all. Treasure, what'd you have? 470. And I have 510. Chris, what'd you have? 700. Zero, zero. Go! Using a formula comparing the feeding success of the parent's generation to the feeding success of the offspring, the students then calculate if their bird died, lived and produced one offspring, 
or lived and produced four offspring. I died. Okay, so you go back to this table. If you make one half the average minus two, so I survived. No. Oh, yeah, so you survived. As they analyze their data, Ms. Chen discovers that some of the students' outcomes are not what she had anticipated. I'm going to ask you to each group to kind of share what beak length you have for each offspring and whether they died or, or survived. And let's all t listen to what the groups have to say. Okay, I had a short beak and I survived with one offspring. Um, Candace had a long beak and also survived with one offspring. And Mike had um, like a no change beak and he survived with four offspring. Let's just hear from one other group of Callie if you can tell us what you guys found. Both Georgia and I, our beaks didn't change and we both had four offspring. And then Tasha had a long beak and she died. And Chris had a short beak and he died. Okay, can we think of what the outcome could be if, let's say, there wasn't extreme competition with some individuals pushing other individuals out of the way and so forth? If there wasn't as much competition, we definitely would have. Yeah, and you had a lift. long beak, and yet you I had a long beak, and I died because died. every time I tried to pull it out, someone would bump me, uh -huh. and then it would die. Uh huh. Obviously. So you would expect with a long beak, could you I feed on any of the types of food? Yeah, I expected that I would have lived, but because uh, Candace, you had a long beak. What other kind of problems did you encounter with using the long beak? Um, it was hard to like get them to close all the way and pick it up. So yeah. it's hard to actually get Yeah, food. so there may be some faults with the, with the beaks yeah. themselves. What do you expect in terms of reproduction of the offspring? I expected the longer beaks to re reproduce more, yes. Mm -hmm. Is that what everyone's opinion yeah. is? Right. You know, I expected what you guys were kind of, what Candace kind of said, I expected the short beaks would die. And the wild type beaks, the middle, medium sized beak, would survive and produce one offspring. They could Science activities in the classroom sometimes yield surprising beak, results, no matter how well planned. Expecting the unexpected can transform or even rescue a lesson. So I'm trying, I'm at a dilemma wh whether or not we can keep on with this discussion. Um, I have some data, some simulated data. If we did the same simulation with, say, a population of 100,000 wading birds, what would happen? So why don't I go ahead and give you this data, and you can take a look at this, and think about this data in terms of answering the discussion questions. And what I want you to do now is go ahead and keep working on those 10 discussion questions in your group. What was kind of tricky is that every group was different. Every group had, had a different set of offspring with different um, variations in their beak length. And so every population changed in a different way and I think that that's okay you know um, as long as as long as the students are still able to to explain how how their population changed that was the important part oh yeah so you definitely so go with that you guys don't need I don't even need you to look at this data you guys can go with your data to answer these questions that looks good all right, what would happen to the population if the second generation were allowed to feed and reproduce? These are wild type beaks? No, these two are long the two. and these are the average. So, but what's ultimately happening in your population? All, all, all of them produced four offspring. One average. Two, two long beaks yep. made four, and the average made four, four and then died. Yeah. Okay, so according to your data, there was another group that had data that was way off. They didn't seem to be able to focus. They weren't kind of, from the questions I was asking that group, it didn't seem like they were able to move in the right direction. So I said, you know what, let's scratch your data and let's use this data. Let's assume that this is the simulation, this is what you found. And going with that data, for that group, it just happened to be a little bit easier for them to understand and they were then able to explain it. I may ask them to kind of use this data mm -hmm. to explain natural selection and evolution, but maybe I will have your group go with what you guys found and tell me, still think about the components of natural selection, still think about how your population would have evolved over time or changed over time. Okay, let's go over um, some of what you learned from this activity and let's start with, I, I want to think about how each group's population evolved over time. Callie, let's start with your group, or anybody in your group can explain. I had a large beak and I died, so I wouldn't have evolved. And the only ones that lived for our group were the 
like the wild type beaks. Both of us had four offspring, so the we our species would have flourished and probably taken over and eaten all the other. So you're all food. of the same species, but individuals in your group, if they had a wild type beak, they continue to f mm -hmm. to produce more and more offspring. And the short beaks, Chris, you said died out. Because I, I can only get the ones on the top, and there are only 16 on top. If the long beaks and the short beaks, because of the mutation, are dying out, then guys, you guys tell me, is their population evolving over time? If only the wild types survived, then uh, their population wouldn't have evolved much. They would have just stayed the same and maybe in a couple of generations when another mutation came along, maybe they would, but for now they won't. Mm -hmm. Does everybody agree with what Mike's saying? Yes. There's no change in the proportion of individuals with different kinds of beaks, right? So let's, let's have this group, one more group, tell me about what they found based on the simulated data. So what happens to your population over time based on that? What happens over time is that the long the long-beaked birds will produce more offspring than the wild type because there was there was four offspring for the long and then one offspring for the um, wild type. So then the population of the wild type, which was once like medium beaks, will eventually become long beaks. Yes, in this simulation. Um, that Nikki is talking about, would this population have evolved over time based on what Nikki just said? Willis, you're saying yes? I think it would evolve because what started from the normal wild type beaks would change into a more dominant population of the long type beaks and the short type would die out. It, even though they just came in for one generation, they would eventually die out and then the, the normal type beaks would remain a smaller part of the population, but they'd still be there, but right. the so, long beaks would take yeah, over more. Yes, so proportionally there are now more long beaks in the population, so we would say that this population evolved great. Why do we say that natural selection is a mechanism for evolutionary change? What has happened here? You guys tell me. If one beak type is favored, that'll spread throughout the gene pool and more, more birds will have it. What else are we missing in terms of what must happen? Variations happen in like individuals first and then their offspring carries that out if it was successful. How do we arri arrive at variation in a population? We've learned from this activity, okay, Allegra. Mutations. Mutations. So we know that mutations are an ultimate source of variation. Without those variations, then natural selection couldn't operate. So over time, what, what happens? They reproduce offspring that carry that mutation as like a regular gene and then they keep on repro reproducing. So you're saying that over time if, if an individual has a trait that makes it be better able to feed, it's going to survive and reproduce more offspring? Right. Bringing back what we said earlier, over time for a population to have evolved, more individuals with that trait are within the population. What role do mutations play in that again? Mutations cause variation and yes. without variation the population would just stay the same and then evolution wouldn't be able to take Excellent. place. So without these variations in your physical traits, then natural selection can't operate or you can't have evolutionary change. For me, evolution was a big objective for the year. And so if we can keep returning to evolution and natural selection um, in different ways so that they, they're using their prior knowledge and adding to that with this lesson adding a new component now, what, are the, what is the role of genetics and mutations to natural selection and evolution? So they've had some background, but now we just keep adding to it.